Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Tim Malone, Family Ministry Director here. I'm excited, Billy, after that video of seeing Genesis or hearing you preach on Genesis next week. Um, I'm going to just do a one-off sermon this week, and sometimes that's a hard thing to do, right? It's like, what are you going to do if you could just preach about one thing? Well, you preach about Jesus, so you know, that's easy. But, um, you know, there's a story in the scripture that happened exactly one week later after Easter. And guess what? It's one week later after Easter. So I said, hey, that makes sense. Let's do this. And we're going to meet a character that many of you are familiar with, Thomas, and his nickname is... The doubter, right. Do you know what his nickname in scripture is? Yes, the twin. He's called the twin. But it's interesting because we know nothing about his twin, if he had a twin, or why they called him twin, if he had like double chins. We don't know, okay? But his nickname is the twin when you translate it uh, in the Aramaic. But we call him the Doubting Thomas, right? The doubter, the skeptic, one of the most famous skeptics of all time. And as we look at his story this morning, we're going to see him experience the risen Jesus Christ in his life. And I hope and pray that you know that power and presence in your life. Because that same power and presence that he experienced and saw is available to every single person in this room and on the internet as you're watching, okay? So just one thought before we jump right in, um, and you probably recognize this, but the, you know, the disciples did not expect the resurrection to happen. So let's not get too harsh on Thomas. As a matter of fact, in Luke's account, the women went, they saw the, reason, they saw the risen Jesus, and they come back, and they tell the disciples, you know what the disciples said? That's nonsense, okay? So they, they didn't believe him too. So Thomas kind of gets a bad rap, but he deserves it. But, uh, you know, resurrection was just not on their minds, right? Um, they hung around Jesus. He explained it, but they just didn't get it. And sometimes it's easy to like, boy, those disciples were really, really dense. They didn't know nothing, right? But, you know, people don't rise from the dead. They never have, Right? They didn't even have a category in their mind for it because it just doesn't happen. You know, so if you experience something that you don't really have a category for it, it's hard to understand. I remember the first time I saw curling. I was like, I don't even know what this is, you know. I, what are they doing? Pushing stuff? They got brooms out there? I don't know. I had no category for that. You know, I don't even believe it's a sport, right? Um, so... The same kind of thing was happened to them, right? People don't rise from the dead. You know, and there's a, a lie going around that the disciples planned the resurrection and they hid his body and they, and they um, you know, they lied that he rose again and they used this to start a religion. That's bunk, man. Read the scripture. There ain't no way they had a category for it. There's no way they had a plan for it. It just wasn't going to happen. So Thomas, we'll see, was a little bit behind his brothers there, and um, he refused. I will not believe in the resurrection of Jesus unless I have undisputable evidence, and we're going to find that. Okay, so uh, we're going to be reading John verses 24 to 29, so you can turn your Bible there, or you can read along on the screen with me. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the doubter, no, sorry, the twin, right? He was nicknamed the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand. Place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you. Um, for the eyewitnesses that wrote this down. Um, help us to believe this morning. 
Speak to us through your word and the Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so kind of four observations this morning. They're written down there for you. Whoops. See, my eyes are getting bad, so I'm trying this new design here. Um, <laughs> see if it works. Uh, so four sections. Thomas doubting, Jesus graciously appearing, Thomas responding, and then Jesus blessing those who believe without seeing. Okay? So, the first thing, um, Thomas doubting. So, verse 24 and 25 here. Thomas, one of the 12, the twin, he wasn't with them. The other disciple said, we have seen him. He says, unless I see the marks, place my finger, I will never believe. So, the first thing that stands out to me is, where was he on Easter night? Why wasn't Thomas with the rest of the disciples? Was he having Easter dinner at the in-laws and he couldn't come? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Maybe Passover dinner? I don't know. But it was interesting that he wasn't there. And the Bible doesn't really tell us except that he wasn't there. I don't know if he was super discouraged or super depressed. Um, but it's interesting too because rumors were already floating around that they had seen Jesus. So there was probably some type of anticipation going on. But Thomas, nope, he's not there on Easter night. Okay? Uh, maybe he thought nothing was going to happen. I don't know. Um, so he's not there, but then he hears from his 10 best friends. Remember, he spent three years with these guys, at least three years. You know, we saw the Lord. He rose from the dead. You know, and he's like, nope, won't believe it. The women were there. We saw him. He rose from the dead. Nope, won't believe it. I think he's a five on the Enneagram, right? He's the investigator, right? He was with Jesus. He saw Jesus' miracles. He heard Jesus teach. He watched Jesus interact with people. You would think that he would believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You would think he'd be like, yeah, let's go. Let's overthrow Rome. This is great. But no. Instead, he says, I will never believe. He uses the word Never. That doesn't sound like doubting. That sounds like no way, uh-uh. I will not believe unless I, I see the wounded body, unless I can touch the wounded body. He had to see it for himself. Thomas the doubter. And I wonder how that week played out with the disciples and him because there's a week in between before Jesus appears again. There must have been some tension there. I wonder if the disciples were like, hey, let's get Peter to tell him. Come on, Peter. No, he denied him. Let's not get Peter. Let's get the women. They saw him first. But whatever, that whole week of interacting, there must have been some tension because all the people believed he rose again except for him, right? But he didn't give up because guess what? Eight days later, this time, he's there, right? For whatever reason, he's hanging out with the disciples and here's what's happened. So, so we see the doubting of Thomas. Now let's see the graciousness of Jesus. I'm at verses 26 and 27 now. Eight days later, later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came, and he stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand. Place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. So here we see Jesus comes in at the locked room again. Peace be with you. And right away, he turns to Thomas and he uses Thomas' own words. Isn't that wonderful? He uses his own words. He's like, come on, come here, buddy. Come here. Look, place your hands here. You know, I was like, if that was me, I would have been, you idiot. You know, I, we, would, we would do that, right? We, we, would, we would make fun of him or we'd be angry with him or we'd be like, why didn't you believe? We would be impatient. But Jesus doesn't do that. Because that's not how Jesus is, right? He is rich in mercy. He is overflowing with good. Jesus moves towards Thomas. He doesn't put up a wall of condemnation. He actually moves towards him. First Peter 3 says, Jesus suffered for our sins to bring us near to God. Not to cast us out, okay? He suffered to bring us close, not to push us away and curse us, right? I love uh, this passage from Isaiah that just, I think this describes Jesus in this scene here. He says, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. He had every chance just to pluck Thomas away, but Jesus doesn't do that. 
You know, and we can learn a little bit from this ourselves, right? How do we treat people who might be struggling in their faith? Or how do we treat people that maybe don't know as much about the Bible? You know, we need to display these characteristics of Jesus to all people. Mercy and kindness. How does God bring us to repentance? The scripture says through kindness, right? Not finger pointing. And just a word for doubters this morning. Maybe you're out there and you can really identify with Thomas and that's great. And doubt can be used to sharpen your thinking and search for answers. And that's a good thing. But, but doubt is not to be meant, it's not a permanent condition. Okay, you can't stay in doubt. It's like having a foot in the air, right? You can't just hold it there. Eventually, you got to come down, step forward or back. You've got to make a decision, right? So doubters, put that foot down. Dive in. Believe. Search for answers. They are there. You cannot ignore Jesus. And guess what? My 92-year-old dad would tell you this. Time is short. Time is short. You can't go through life with your foot up in the air forever. You know, you've got to put it down. Go to Jesus. Share your, your doubts with him. Talk about your discouragement. Find someone you trust. Talk to Pastor Billy, Pastor Dave. Talk to me. Come and have your doubts assured. So, second part. Look how gracious Jesus is. And then the third part, I'm going to spend most of my time right here. The response of Thomas. He says, my Lord and my God. Thomas reaches an amazing, astonishing conclusion. He sees the mortal wounds of Jesus, a hole in his side. This man should not be walking around. He should not be breathing and eating and talking. He's got a hole in his side. But he is. Right? Right? And, and, and Thomas sees that, and he's amazed. And he says, my Lord, and he also says, my God. And this was the first time I could find in Scripture where a disciple actually calls Jesus God. You know, not teacher, not rabbi, not friend. He calls him God, right? Thomas, the doubter. Jesus, you are God. And guess what? Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Okay, Jesus doesn't rebuke him. His identity is finally known. There's a deep realization in Thomas's heart of who Jesus is, right? And it makes sense because in everything in Scripture has pointed to this moment. One commentator says this, From the wedding at Cana to the raising of Lazarus, from the testimony of John the Baptist to the intercessory prayer, every discourse... Every miracle points to this superlative conclusion. Jesus is God. Spoken from he who is the doubter. And then it's not long before Paul writes about him, the image of the invisible God, and he will be given the name above all names. And the author of Hebrews calls him the radiance of the glory of God and the imprint of his nature. Jesus is God. And I think about how did, how did Thomas feel when that happened? I mean, the rush that just might come up in his heart. You know, the things of this world must have just been disappeared, right? He had a clear view of who God was. Everything has changed. His heart is undone. Uh, you know, he found what he was searching for. Jesus revealed his true identity to him. Everything was going to be better. Everything was going to be fine. He didn't have any more worries. You know, this, that moment of meeting Jesus there, he probably held that for the rest of his life. And even on that day when he was martyred, he probably still was saying what? My Lord and my God. 100% convinced. 100% changed. My Lord and my God. And um, as I was kind of preparing for this Charles Spurgeon did it, an amazing sermon, because all his sermons are amazing, um, just on how beautiful this is. And he points out that this, he calls them the saints, we call us believers, followers of Christ, often experience and exclaim the same thing. In other words, 
when we encounter and experience the presence of the Lord, we too say, my Lord and my God. Uh, I was in Annapolis, Maryland on Thursday uh, at a meeting with a bunch of youth pastors. And as I walked into the church, I looked on the wall and there was like nine pictures of Ukraine, which is kind of an interesting thing to see when you walk into a church and there's rubble. Um, and I'm like, hey, John, what's, what's going on here? Why do you got these pictures? And he's like, well, look closely. Because in every picture, there's beauty. Okay, there were hints of beauty. And, you know, sometimes there were like plants or, you know, there was beauty in every single one of those pictures. And he said, that's God's story. How he brings healing and life out of death and destruction. I was like, yeah, that's what God does. What does sin do? Shatters our life. We've got shards all over the place. What does God do? Picks them up. And he starts putting those pieces back together. And out of the broken and the hurting and the destruction, he starts building something beautiful. That's who he is. That's what he does. That's what he's doing right now. My Lord and my God. And guess what? Every single person in this room has experienced some type of shattering, right? We don't like to talk about it. We try to pretend we got it all together. But I know because this is a broken world that we've all had that brokenness. And Cornerstone, Billy was talking earlier about our 15 goals. One of our goal is we want to have a church culture where brokenness in our lives can be revealed to others without fear or judgment or gossip. Gossip. Well, we will respond in love. And you've heard some of the testimonies up here on Sunday morning. People have talked about the shattered brokenness of their lives and how the Lord has rebuilt it one day at a time. The hymn writer wrote, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. <laughs> Think about that. That could be your song, right? Through many trials, you have come. And maybe you've been in a trial where like, there is no way we're going to make it out of this. One step in the wrong direction and we're crashing. And somehow, in some way, God has brought us through. Even on that darkest night or when we're losing hope, God brings us through. David writes, he makes our feet secure like the deer on the heights. So it made me think of these goats. Have you ever seen these goats before? These guys are amazing. They, they walk these rocks. They climb these cliffs. And I was like, what a great picture. Because that's how life is sometimes. We're hanging on the cliff. There's no way I'm going to make it. But he keeps our feet secure. And we somehow make it to the other side. And we look back. And you know what we say? My Lord and my God. That is what he does. That is who he is. That is so amazing. And I think there's many stories like that. People who are deep in addiction, like I was with alcohol and drugs, deep in addiction of pornography, where the chains hold tight and they're prisoners. But guess what the Lord does? He delivers. He breaks the chain and he breaks the darkness. And they, they exclaim, my Lord and my God. People have grieved. We all have grieved the loss of loved ones. Grief is hard. But Jesus, the man of sorrows, who is well acquainted with grief, says, there is hope. I have conquered death. And on the other side is abundant life forever. And by faith we say, my Lord and my God. And for those who have been abused or suffered trauma, the hurt and pain runs deep. And it can feel like you're going to be overwhelmed or drowned. But God, you know what he says? He reaches, <laughs> sorry. He reaches down from heaven and he rescues us. He draws us out of the deep waters and sets us on a rock. Why? That's who he is. My God and my Savior. 
And for those who are anxious, stressed out, confused, unsured, unsettled, and overwhelmed. Remember, Jesus is the one who went out and he told the wind and the waves to be still. And they were. And he can tell us the same thing. Be still. And you'll hear that quiet whisper. I love you. I got this. And we can exclaim. My My Lord. Lord. Yes, right. But thank you. Thank you. I was waiting for it. My Lord and my God. And think about the people you know that trust the Lord. And they're facing death. They're walking through the valley of the shadow and of death. Yet they are comforted by the presence of the Lord. He is there to escort them and take them home. And they are at peace. And they say, it is well with my soul. And we hear them say, my Lord. And my God. God. Yes. And, and even more so, maybe not quite as intense, but just some of you sit in the morning. And you're reading your Bible. You're reading and praying and thinking on him. Or maybe you go out and you walk in the woods and you're impressed by nature. And you feel his presence and his peace right there with you. And it's real. And you taste his goodness. And in your heart you proclaim. My Lord and my my God. God. Amen. The scripture describes Jesus as the one who turns mourning into dancing. Where else can you find that promise? Who can make a way where there is no way? Who can turn a a heart of stone into a heart of flesh? Who can wash away our sin? Who can bring us near to God? My Lord and my God. Amen? Amen. 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 You got the point. Thomas exclaims, my Lord and my God. He can do it. All right. Last point, quick. Verse 29, Jesus responds to Thomas' response. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen yet believed. All right, math people, now's your time. All right, maybe 600, maybe 700. Let's just say 1,000 people saw the resurrected Jesus with their own eyes. That's probably a little high, 1,000 people, okay? So I have 1,000. So what percentage is 1,000 of a multitude? Because guess who's in heaven? The, the, the Bible says there's too many to count. It's a multitude. There's a multitude of people that are going to be with the Lord forever. So what's 1,000 of a multitude? What's the percent? It's, pr- it's pretty, pretty small. So I think like 99.9999999999% of people who believe in Jesus have never seen him. We've never seen him, Right? That's a lot of people who live by faith and not by sight. And Jesus says, all you who believe and have not seen, you are blessed. Even more than Thomas. Blessed are those who not see and believe. We are called to live by faith, not by sight. I say seeing um, is not believing, but believing is seeing. And Jesus has given everything we need to believe. We got the word of God. We got the Holy Spirit, right? Um, And some of you might be out there, well, Tim, just call me Downing Thomas. I need to see Jesus to believe. No, you don't. No, you don't. It's interesting. Um, I'm going to close with this story. In the scripture, uh, there's a rich man and a beggar who die. And the rich man goes to torment, to a place of torment. And the beggar goes with, he's up with Abraham. And there's this great chasm in between. And the man in torment, he asked Abraham, send Lazarus back to my brothers and warn them. And Abraham says, your brother has Moses and the prophets. Okay, and we have Jesus and the gospels, right, to add to Moses and the prophets. And the rich man in the place of torment says, no. If someone comes back from the dead and tells them, then they will believe. You know what Abraham says? He says, no, they won't. If they're not going to believe the Moses and the prophets, they're not even going to believe if someone comes back from the dead.
God has made himself known. We don't believe because we don't want to believe. But Jesus invites you in and he says this, do not disbelieve, but believe. He invites everyone, all sinners, all the broken to come to him, to come near and know him. This is the good news of the gospel. Jesus invites you into life, everlasting life with him. And he says, whoever believes in me will have eternal life. And in your heart, the words will rush out in joyous explanation. When you come to know him, my Lord and my God. And for those of you who already believe, Jesus has called you blessed. Trust his power. Trust his presence. Trust his promises. And may you declare wholeheartedly, my Savior, my God, my Lord and my God. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming back from the dead. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing plan of redemption and how uh, you take us as broken vessels and begin to build something beautiful in us. God, I pray for those who are in doubting, who are not understanding. I pray by your spirit that you would make yourself known to them. And Lord, I pray for those who are living by faith and not by sight. And uh, you know what they're going through. Oh, Lord, work in their heart by your spirit, by your word. Help them to see you and know your power and presence and goodness in their life. Help them to say in their heart, my Lord and my God, thank you for loving us, Jesus, in your name.